Okay. Greetings, everyone. This is uh, Robert Thurman, uh, Professor Emeritus at uh, Columbia uh, of Indo-Tibetan Buddhist Studies, or Buddhology, as I prefer to call my academic profession. Buddhology, the study of enlightenment, the study of Buddha. <laughs> and uh, I'm honored to speak to you today uh, on the day of the uh, that the Tibetan people celebrate as the Chungkok Duchen, the great um, memorial of the turning of the wheel of Dharma. The Buddha's first teaching in uh, Sarnath, what is nowadays Sarnath, in those days Urshipatana, and um, near Varanasi. And um, there the Buddha walked, uh, had walked over several days all the way from Bodhgaya, from where the Bodhi tree, Bodhimanda, was. And uh, he, um, to teach his five uh, companions, who had been his companions in the mortification of the flesh in the six years of asceticism uh, that he had spent before deciding that that was too extreme in the opposite direction from the, the youth of sensory indulgence, sensual indulgence that he had engaged in, kind of a counteractive, counterbalance of all the years of uh, sensual pleasures. He had sensual mortification and then rejected both of them as too extreme and uh, decided to teach the middle way. And according to the grand vehicle, the great vehicle, Mahayana Sutras, he had spent 49 days teaching the Buddhavatamsaka Sutra, the, uh, which he taught to various deities in the Rupa Datu and the Kama Datu. Um, and um, bodhisattvas from other world systems and Buddhas who came to celebrate his having attained perfect enlightenment and so forth, and the grand vehicle's way of seeing it, uh, which was um, uh, kept hidden from the general population in India by Buddha's um, mandate for 400 years until the time of Nagarjuna, Nagasena, Nagarjuna, these, these folks, these uh, Nagar. Naga named people. And um, because he wanted to ripen the society by the bhikshu and bhikshuni order uh, that he founded um, based on the monastic teaching uh, that um, emphasizing renunciation. And he didn't want to have the grand vehicle of the teaching of non duality of samsara and nirvana to confuse the society and to get mixed up as a version of monism, which he did not teach. He taught non-dualism, which is not the same as monism, you could say. You know, we assign meaning to different terms, but that you could say that. So today, in that celebration, I will teach about the Four Noble Truths in this brief talk. And behind me, there is the mandala of the Kala Chakra, which is um, I'm very fond of, which is an important Indian Tantra, which the Tibetans have been keeping very properly and assiduously over many years. And up on the right hand corner there, up in that corner, um, above my right side, and is a Nagarjuna, um, who was the one who brought forth the grand vehicle and the tantric vehicle in our Mahayana view not in the view of contemporary modern materialist historians. And on the lower corner, I'm not going to point out all of them, on the lower one is the Kalki, the Tibetan and in, Indian and Tibetan version of Kalki, who all Hindus will be familiar with as the 10th avatar of Vishnu, but the Buddhists think of him as, a, as an emanation of Vajrapani, the, the Buddha, or a bodhisattva who symbolizes the power of enlightenment. And then the little picture I always keep on the other side, on that side here, over here, uh, the picture that I keep there is the picture of Maitreya. 
that um, sits in the Dalai Lama's residence in Drebung Monastery in Tibet and was not just was saved from destruction by having grain piled up in front of it and it's in the, the building in which it sits. So it was thought to have been a granary and they didn't see it or they would have destroyed it, of course. And um, it's said to be a tong dro, that seeing it makes you liberated. So it's a very positive vision of the future Buddha, the loving Buddha, Maitreya Buddha, who will come again to India, again to Bodh Gaya, but he will be born in the Brahmin caste, actually, not in the Kshatriya class, the warrior caste, uh, because the world will be more peaceful at that time, they say, however many thousands of years in the future. I know when he really had their different versions of how, when that will be. <clears throat> and he will also teach the Four Noble Truths, or as I like to call them, the Four Friendly Facts, the Arya Satya. I prefer to call that the Friendly Facts. Not really prefer, but I, I alternatively call it that. So to get people not so nervous about Arya, what that means. Actually, the word Arya, which is attached to the Arya Satyani, Chattari Arya Satyani, the Four Noble Truths, as we normally translate it. Uh, the Arya that is translated is not, although the word English word noble is like a class term for an upper class person. And I think Arya was a term at that time for the three uh, higher castes, you know, Brahma, Brahman, and Kshatriya and Vaishya, Brahmana, Kshatriya and Vaishya, who were admitted to the Vedic cult, and therefore it meant noble in a class term. And perhaps before that, in ancient Vedic times, it had meant noble in a racial term, it's possible, return, which to which it was returned by the crazy Germans at their moment of craziness. Uh, 70 years ago, whenever it was. and uh, <clears throat> But when Buddha used it for the satya, he had another specific meaning for it. To him, it meant the opposite of a pratekjana, uh, what I call an alienated individual or a separated individual, which work he took out of the Vedic class system, those terms, but then he changed them to create a kind of new system uh, the Buddhist system. And there, the, the protect jana is the person who is alienated or separated, not in the sense of can't go to church or can't go to the ritual, sacrificial ritual, but in the sense of separated from the universe. Because that's an ordinary person like me who thinks I'm separate from the world around me and from other people. And therefore, I get involved in egotism, thinking that I must only pursue my own self-interest and I get involved in struggling against the universe, thinking that somehow by doing so, I will master it, perhaps, if I become particularly deluded and become like king, let's say, or head of a country or president or whatever other roles there are in different societies, and become deluded and think I can master everything, which a few years in office and I realize I certainly can't. <laughs> and of course, the universe also, there's time and space, Time means we get old, we die, you know, we're reborn in lesser circumstances, perhaps if we're not careful, we, we uh, or it could be better circumstances. But nevertheless, whatever situation we're in, when we are a separated person, a protectana, we uh, will not prevail. We'll be frustrated. We'll be living in stress. Temporarily we'll be well-fed, temporarily we'll have wealth, temporarily we'll have good relations, temporarily we'll be victorious, etc. But we'll lose all of that always and we'll die, you know. We'll temporarily be healthy, but we'll get sick and we'll die. So so that's the that's the first noble truth. But oh, wait, I'm still just pressing noble. So that's protect jana, separated person. And Arya means in relation to that, someone who has become aware that they and what is not them, the environment around them, the other people around them, are not really different. They may illusorily seem to be different, but actually they're all one, they're all interconnected. And the boundaries between one and another are only arbitrarily drawn. And therefore it's not a situation of them against the universe, because they are the universe. And of course, that could be good or bad at this stage. I haven't explained that yet. 
But the point is, then it's not the completely unwinnable situation of you, the little person, versus everything else. Sometimes everything else seems to be for you, then that's when you'll be happy. But mostly it collapses, that, that situation is temporary. And that is actually called the suffering of change in the first friendly fact or noble person. Anyway, so Arya then means someone who has had a visceral experience of being the other person, of being the world, of having gone outside of their sense of boundary of I'm separate from everything and it's just me versus it, versus all of it and them. And instead, I am one with all of it, and we are we, me and other beings, and we, and even the trees and the plants and the flowers, and even death is still me. I'm not non-death, you know, I'm not against life. Death is not against me. Death is something, it is a transition I go through, and it is part, it's part of my being. It's all tied up in my vast being, and actually it's a, it can be, if I become conscious of it ahead of time, if I die ahead of time by mentally understanding, by going out of my skin, you could say, by going out of my mind, out of my skin temporarily through meditation, meditational experience through some sort of transcendental experience, which I was given instructions of how to achieve by my teachers, then, then death becomes like a place for quantum leaping, for improving, the way of being one with everyone and yet illusorily a little bit separate, it's, you know, responsible for my own part of it and so forth. And uh, to the level of the inconceivable level of becoming a Buddha, a perfectly enlightened being who is the, who is the Arya in the sense of noble and friendly because they only care for the welfare of others because they're fully satisfied themselves because of that vastness of feeling infinite and one with everything, apparently involves the super bliss, a great bliss. Okay, so, so that's the meaning of Arya Satya. That's why they're called Arya Satya. They don't mean they're for upper class or upper caste people only. It means it's for people who are upper, they're better in a way, they're higher, they're more friendly, because they're more friendly, because they identify with other people because they know that they and other people are really in the same boat. We're all together in it. They even can empathize completely with the other person and they can effectively share their bliss of wisdom, of understanding with the other people. That makes them Arya. And then once Arya, then there's levels of how vast that sense of, of, of oneness is and that the supreme infinite level of it the inconceivable liberation, what they call achintya vimoksha, the inconceivable liberation level of it, uh, they are one with every other being, or gods, humans, animals, you know, plants, planets, whatever it may be, everything. Okay? So that's what Arya means. That's why these are called Arya Satyas. And, and uh, I, uh, noble truth is okay, but remember, truth has several meanings, and truth can mean a kind of propositional thing, like a verbal truth, like a dogma. I think that's unfortunately what, what the early translators of Buddhist thought, Buddhist text, they thought that truth was like the credo of Buddhists, that you have to believe the Four Noble Truths in order to be a Buddhist. Uh, because other religions, you have to believe something. But actually, Buddha wanted you to question everything and come to understand it for yourself without believing it, without evidence, anything. He didn't want any blind faith of any kind. So, so in a way, it, it's a, almost a little bit more scientific than religious, because Buddha, Buddhahood means you know everything. You don't just believe it, you know it. And that's the only way you're really one with it is when you know it. And of course, knowing it to the fullest level is where you know, sort of like a CAT scan knows something. You know, you know it by merging with it. So you kind of know it from inside out, you know, because you're 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 cloud-like, you're you're a, a cloud-like being. You're not just some sort of person isolated away in a skin behind a set of senses that sort of just imagines some, some other thing over there and has the names for it and concepts for it, but actually doesn't merge with it and is, doesn't feel it from within as an enlightened being does. Okay, so. So now the first of the noble truths when he met. So then after teaching the gods and all sorts of other beings for 49 days, 
which in the grand vehicle is what he was doing. He wasn't just taking a vacation <laughs> because he didn't need one because life was a vacation for him once enlightened because he was totally stressless, totally happy and so on. That's what Buddhahood is, total happiness. And I love the guy because he, he said, ah, oh, I know everything now, Sarvanya, I know everything, infinitely, I know it all. But I'm so sorry, I can't explain it to you. Or at least whatever I say about it, you can't just latch on to it and that will be your salvation. You have to understand it yourself. And But the good news, you can. And the good news, although I can't just give you a dogma you can hang on to and know it that way, I can know it conceptually by believing in that proposition, I can give you instructions of how you can open up your mind and open up your experience and your, your heart and really know what you are and what the world is. And you have that ability, human beings have that ability. Because I was a, a brat prince. I was a spoiled brat prince by my dad who wanted me to be a conqueror. So he tried to make me really happy in my palace. And, uh, and so he spoiled me. And then I really tortured myself, but none of it worked. But now I understand it, okay? And you can too, that's the good news, okay? So the first of the noble truth or, or, or a noble fact, and why he called that a noble, because if you empathize with other beings, you will have a noblesse oblige about them. You will feel responsible for them, like a good king, like a good ruler, like a good politician. You will take responsibility for the people and you will not oppress them. And that makes you noble. I mean, that in the good idea of what a noble was in the previous time, you know, you, know? you won't attack them and so on and harm them, right? So you'll be friendly, genuinely friendly, because you'll genuinely care about them. That makes someone a genuine friend, right? That's why I like to call it friendly. And then I check to change truth into fact or reality, which can, satya can also mean reality. And what is, what is in other words, satya, you know? What is, to, is the way things are, you know? And uh, the first one is what's called the noble truth of suffering. And a lot of misunderstanding has arisen from that. Because, in fact, the previous pope, or two popes ago, um, one and a half popes ago, um, uh, they said, oh, they couldn't understand how anyone could ever be a Buddhist because they're being told that they can only suffer. And that's so sad and so bad, and it's really terrible. And it is, I feel so sorry for them. The nice, sweet uh, the Bened uh, Pope, Pope uh, John Paul, has written that chapter written for him in his Doctrine of the Faith called um, uh, 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 by, by Benedict, Cardinal Ratzinger at the time, right? He said that. But that's totally wrong. Buddha doesn't want anybody. The whole point of Buddha's teaching is he does, you know, nobody needs to suffer. No human being because they've already suffered a lot to get to be human, and they have given so much, and they've become so intelligent, and so ability to empathize with others, and so social, pooled their intelligence through marvelous language, because they didn't attack each other right away always. And they talked to each other, and they chatted. They didn't eat each other the minute they met. <laughs> they didn't eat everyone they meet, like a lion or a tiger, you know? They hung out and chatted and became so intelligent and altruistic, basically, and social, with a nice mom who gave birth to them and then fed them and showed them what true altruistic love is like. So humans, and then they had built this huge brain that they can think all about all kinds of things and, and figure out what life is. And they've, they've evolved to that point through a greater deal of suffering. So Buddha doesn't want anyone to suffer. He ultimately doesn't want any animal of any kind to suffer. Any sensitive being, it doesn't sentient, but we call sentient or sensitive being, it doesn't want them to suffer. So the first friendly fact is, since you can become enlightened and completely happy, then if you persist in being a separated person, an alienated individual who thinks they're the one apart from everything else, then you will be, you will suffer. So this is in order to help you renounce lesser goals, less grand, less magnificent, less noble goals in your human life than becoming enlightened. 
and becoming truly loving and becoming truly wise, that means. And instead you want to make a million dollars, you want to be a king, you want to conquer the world, you want to dominate this person, that person, you want to have 25 children, you want to do, you want to have a million, billion dollars or whatever, you want to be famous, whatever things that in the separated individuals, alienated individuals do in order to try to somehow convince themselves that they can master this impossible situation of me, the little me, versus the potentially infinite universe, which is not exactly a practical proposition, is it now, really? If you think about it, it isn't. And so it's not rocket science, the noble truth of suffering. It is simply friendly, factual uh, thing to understand and then help you shift your priorities, okay? And then the second noble truth for friendly fact was the cause of that suffering. And indeed, the cause is that protect Janahood, feeling you're separated, and that is a misunderstanding. So it is not merely ignorance, you know, some people, avidya in, science, in the original language, avidya, either the colloquial version or the Sanskrit version, avidya. But that avidya doesn't just mean that you didn't count all the fish in the ocean. Or you don't know how many atoms in the pin of a head of a pin. You know, that isn't the that that's not what's causing you to suffer. What is causing you to suffer is an active misknowing. In other words, you think you know that you're the separate being and that everything else is different from you. You think you know that you have a fixed identity inside there that somehow is suffering because it gets constantly bumped into by relational things. You think you know others are different than you and they're sort of out to get you or you know what I mean? All these things are misknowledge is a better word, a better translation of abhidya, asatidya, gloss as asatidya, knowing what is not the case as if it were the case, being caught in illusion and delusion. Okay, that's the root cause. And then the, in the Four Noble Truths, to talk to his ascetics, he wanted to shock them a bit since they were involved in self-mortifying by saying lust, greed, desire is the cause. Because of course the alienated person just desires to be something else all the time, because they know in a way that it's impossible to thrive and survive as a separated being. Because ultimately sickness, old age, death, even rebirth will cause suffering. Losing your loved ones, finding the ones you don't, meeting the ones you don't like, et cetera. You know, Although they have lots of lists of suffering, tremendous numbers of lists. You know? And so the point is, that's the, those are the causes that misknowing. But the good news is then you see, the four friendly facts are like a doctor's friendly diagnosis. He says, okay, you're suffering. I got it, I can see the symptom. And I can diagnose the cause which is your misunderstanding of what you are, where you are, what the world is, what is the purpose of your human embodiment, what is the best use of their human embodiment within the reality that you are in, and you feel you're in and that you are. And uh, in that diagnosis, you don't know what is the best way. And if you did, you wouldn't have to do that suffering. So that's a good diet, that's the good prognosis. So then the prognosis is the third friendly fact, the third noble truth, and that's my favorite one, of course, as it should be everyone's favorite one. And that is the one why people liked Buddha. Indian, ancient Indian Bharata people from all the various nations of India, the reason they fell in love with Buddha. And they added Buddha to their culture. And they tolerated him having all these people drop out from their productivity working and their the women from their childbearing and their household cleaning and cooking and whatever they were doing, and the men from conquering each other or doing this or building houses or whatever. They were they allowed these bhikshus and bhikshunis, these mendicants, to go around getting free lunch because they, they were rich enough. It was the richest part of Eurasia was ancient Bharata. 
It had the greatest river valleys, alluvial valleys, and the greatest agriculture, and tremendous uh, resources, you know, jewels and iron and copper, and oh, incredible, wonderful, the subcontinent was, you know, the Indian plate pushing up the Himalayas and all, revealing all the treasures of the earth in wonderful, great you know, Ratnavan, you know, jewel-bearing India, okay? And everybody wanted to go there and rob it, of course, <laughs> as they, they always did. Very sad, you know, and a few of them settled down to enjoy it, indeed, you know. But anyway, they tolerated these mendicants. The Confucian Chinese people, they didn't, they wouldn't have one person getting a free lunch, just like in America today or any industrial society. Welfare or free lunch or social, socialism is considered horrible. Everybody has to work, work, work to prove their worth. But Buddha said, no, the human being has a huge worth as an evolutionary product of their own effort. And they should be able to fully expand their understanding and replace misunderstanding with understanding, misknowing with wise knowing, wisdom knowing. That's the purpose of human life. And all societies should be organized to uphold that as the great moksha, the great liberation of human beings. And that, that's the reason for the huge push of the first mid first millennium BCE that we find in the Upanishads and in Jainism and Buddhism, the leader, the, the leading most intelligent beings became Shramanas and they went to ashrams and they went beyond ashrams and Buddha's one who created a, a society-wide ashram of all the bhikshus and bhikshunis, you know, the, the viharas, you know, the sangha. Uh, he didn't want them isolated like a, like a retreat. He wanted them only seven stones throw away from the marketplace, so they'd have to beg the next day's brunch to eat before noon, the one meal a day they asked for, to eat that before noon every day. They couldn't take two days' worth of food so they could be isolated. He wanted them inter interacting with people but renouncing the ordinary productivity things which the land could afford because of the wealth of India, and therefore the Indian people supported them, basically. Well, some of them were grumpy about it, now and then they were sort of, they were, just, they were too many. Some of them weren't real proper pictures. Some were just using that to get free food, et cetera. They had their ups and downs about it, but they basically loved it. And the 16, 1700 years, it helped all the different forms of Hinduism interacted with them beautifully and created the wonder of classical Indian civilization, the lead civilization of Indo-Europe, indeed, was proven by the fact that Ashoka and the following emperors and things never marched out of India to try to conquer anybody else, ever. They never did, showing their superiority in that sense. <clears throat> Nonviolent, ahimsa, right? So the third noble truth is Buddha's good news. You can be free of suffering. You can do it in this life, even. You can do it for all your lives. You can do it, transcend everything. Nirvana is the real reality of everything, actually. To some, that was too much of a leap, a stretch at first. To the majority of people, they couldn't quite get that. So he let them think, well, Nirvana is somewhere else than this world. It's, you know, sort of not heaven. It doesn't mean heaven. You know, like a happy hunting ground or a heaven or the realm of the ancestors. It's something beyond that. And we don't really say clearly what it is, except by sort of negating it and other things. And we don't say there is nothing, but it's not one of the formless realms, the realm of nothingness, the realm of beyond nothing, consciousness and unconsciousness, the realm of infinite space, the realm of infinite consciousness, the four arupa datus, arupya datus, the four formless realms, it's not those, and it's not nothing. But he wouldn't quite say what it was, but he let them think it was some elsewhere for some time, because he knew they would discover that elsewhere is the deep nature of here. It's the real nature of here, that here is elsewhere than what we think it is, coming out of our misknowing. So anyway, that was the good news. That was the prognosis of the friendly doctor, of the friendly fact is you're going to be cured of suffering. You're going to be happy. You know, Westerners stupidly and wrongly thought that when they discovered it, that, well, Asian people didn't conquer us. So therefore, they're sort of backward, 
you know, they didn't come and kill us all and rob us of ourselves. So that makes them backward in their way they thought, you know, imperialists, you know, right? And and so therefore they must be their religions must be telling them, yeah, you should be suffering. So you just suffer. So that's a, that's why they, they got all completely obsessed with that truth of suffering or that fact of suffering for the unenlightened. Remember, Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. Remember that? That's more pessimistic than whatever Buddha never said. Even the suffering, ignorant, misknowing life is not worth living. He never said that. Human life is incredibly valuable, in fact. And it's very important because it's the life form that we've evolved to from having been many animals and all kinds of other things. Even gods just lounging around in heavens. And finally, we got this being right in the middle of the universe. Not that powerful, not that pleasurable, not also that terribly horrible suffering, not that tortured by some lower state, not in hell. So we can think and we know our vulnerability and we have a godlike understanding level we can have. And so we can go beyond human and God, any kind of separated being who thinks they're separate from others, even if they're gods, is still going to suffer because there'll be bigger gods who will beat them up. There'll be gods who will, won't like, you know, will not worship. There will be people who won't worship them. So then they'll be upset. So once, as long as they think they're separate, I think the great Brahma somehow is very close because he, he really loves Buddha. He asked Buddha to teach. He said, tell people, I didn't create this. I don't make them suffer. I like them to not suffer. So please go tell them it's not my responsibility only. I do my best for them all. And but they have to do their part if they want to be free of suffering. And you tell them what to do. So then the fourth noble truth is the therapy, the friendly, force friendly fact. A friendly doctor tells you, okay, here's the therapy. It is the path, the noble eightfold path, the friendly eightfold path. And that friendly fact goes all the way from correcting your worldview, your attitude, your theory of life, your belief or view as a dhrsti, as they say in Sanskrit, they call a belief a view, that which sort of focuses your way to see things, interpret them in a certain way, and all the way to samadhi, realistic samadhi. And I people go right view, right this, right that, which is not wrong, of course, but it's right, not wrong. But I think better is realistic and unrealistic for, for uh, you know, um, uh, mitya, uh, unrealistic for mitya, and for uh, 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 yandak, uh, samyak, samyak, and for samyak, I think, uh, or sama, uh, realistic is better. Because right is sort of makes you think, well, it's right according to some rule. And when you're, you follow the rule and you followed it and it's right, so that again, it goes back into that kind of dogmatic religious thing, like we're just supposed to do this because it's right and that's wrong. And that's okay, but actually realistic and unrealistic goes beyond that. And it says your your view will correspond with what is real. It will that's realistic. And and unrealistic is what is is being dominated by delusion and illusion, thinking illusion is real, which it isn't. So realistic and unrealistic is really good, I think. Actually, I got it from a guy named Alan Wallace. But then he dropped and he's back and right this and that and the other. He didn't realize how realistic his choice of realistic was. But I always like to give people attribution. I don't pretend I invented it when somebody else did. You know, that's that's what's left of scholarliness in my emeritus mind is giving proper attribution. Okay. And the 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 the, the eightfold realistic path, uh, the friendly path, the noble path begins with realistic view. And the realistic view is the view of interrelativity, of relationality. It's actually Buddha's discovery of relativity, actually, like century, millennia before Einstein. And the way he discovered it is that he discovered, he looked totally thoroughly with like an atom smashing mind of sharp samadhi, total one pointed focus on even atoms and even subatomic particles. He smashed the atoms of seeming solid realities and discovered what he called shunyata, which means openness, emptiness. We call it, people generally call it emptiness. I prefer voidness because it's only two syllables, but that's not wrong, that's correct. 
but it's, it's different from nothingness because there's no nothing when something is open, when there's no core to something and it's just open. It doesn't mean it's nothing, it's an open space, right? So it's not nothingness, it's not a bhavatva, it's shunyata. And shunya comes from shvi, which means to swell, like a seed when it's moistened, it swells up and there's an empty space inside where the germ can bear fruition, right? So what that is, is it means that all relational things are empty or free of any non-relational absolute component. So to project absolutes into everything, the way we habitually do, starting with, we th I think I'm absolute, you know, and my separated entity, identity is absolute. That's, what, that's the start. And then we project them into everything, absolute floor, absolute wall, absolute table, absolute atom, absolute subatomic particle, absolute this, that, the other, starting with the self when we think it's absolute. And uh, in fact, the, the, self is, the self is absolutely relative. In a way, you could say it's, language will always be fallible. The Jains were wonderful about that. Their siadvada, what they call their maybeism, in the sense that you can sort of say almost anything about anything in a certain context. But the more helpful one is to use negation, to break out of being stuck in any false attribution of absoluteness to anything that you think you can hold on to because then you get stuck on it. Like you get stuck in yourself when you think you're absolute. And then you're, you find relations to be awkward and you're not good at them and you're not nice to people. And you're sort of, so your view is the view of relationality. Om ye dharma hetu prabhava hetun tesham tatagata hi avadat tesham cheyo nirodo evam vadi mahasamaniye swaha. That was the epitome of Buddha's teaching that there's everything is causal and therefore he knows how to interfere or cease to terminate causes of particular things. And that's what he advocates, Evambadi, and he's a great vacationer, a shramana, he's going to an ashram. He's a great dropout, not an ascetic. He's not giving, he's giving, he's giving up suffering, not giving up, not giving up like great thing of having to like plant a garden, plant a farm and raise children and conquer, fight in battles and do the all terrible things that the lay people have to do in societies. You know, he's, he's, he's an ashram, he's just tired of that. He goes to ashram, he's a shramana. Okay, mahashramaniye, in uh, case, swaha. All right, so, so that's the Four Noble Truths. And then there's realistic motivation. Once you, once you develop a rel relativistic view, and uh, freedom view, combination of freedom and relationality. Because within freedom, there's nothing to do but relate. And you only relate relationally. And then you get better at it because you realize it's, it is the absolute thing to do. <laughs> and you don't worry about finding some frozen place outside of it all where you can just feel absolute. But of course you can't feel absolute because absolute means non-relative. So no relative being can feel it. Simple as that. So the openness of negation, that negation can lead you to, pratisheda, pure negation, that is then opening to playing with relativity in a, in a happy way. Because it's based on an inner freedom and a realization you're not being coerced into playing. Okay? So anyway, but then, then in that kind of expression, I'm trying to express the inexpressible, so don't worry about it, all right? So that, but once you do get a sort of more realistic view, then you get a realistic motivation of what to do with your moments, your limited number of moments of being a human, being with a human intelligence, being awake and wishing to awaken further past the sleepwalking of just living out your ingrained narrative of your cultural indoctrination and your theoretical indoctrinations and conceptual network of your language and your culture and so forth. And you want to actually really feel and experience and, and, and embrace life and reality and others, and then you'll be happy. Okay, so that's your motivation is to become enlightened. And then realistic speech is very important because you might think since you can't express the ultimate nature of things, that it's better not to say anything or even learn anything, just shut down your whole brilliant, wonderful language, human thing, bark, 
the noble speech, you know, the enlightening speech, wrong speech is, is how you educate yourself. So you need speech. So you have realistic speech, though. And then you have realistic ethics, karma. Karma means a biological theory of evolutionary ethics. It doesn't mean something mystical. It doesn't mean fate. It means it means action that will have an aspect and it will have influence on your fate. But that's you have freedom to make choices and, and choose actions that will make your fate good. And you have the choice of making bad ones that will make your fate, fate bad. So it's a real responsibility of a realistically relative being to, to make choices where they evolve positively. So that's realistic ethics, karma. And then within that, because we are social beings and, and even, a, even a mendicant depends for lunch, for brunch, on the generous person, the lay person, uh, the farmer, the trader, the restaurant owner, whatever it is, and uh, the king, and uh, the generous king who supports free lunches. And uh, so then you have realistic livelihood. And then you don't want to kill anybody. So you don't do, prefer not to have any profession of killing, of violence. You don't go as, as you know, Buddha thought that Jains were great, but a little impractical and you can't farm because you'll plow, will run over insects. And that's very strict. That's more strict. But they didn't, he didn't think that would be practical. So then that's a realistic livelihood. And then once you have realistic livelihood, I think you're up to six. That's number six, I think. View, motivation, speech, ethics, livelihood. That's right. Once you have realistic livelihood, then you become realistic creativity, I like to call it. It, it can be translated virya, effort, courage, uh, vigor. Some people translated it. But it's all of those, energy, enterprise, you can, industry, you can give it any kind of thing of some active, constructive and creative thing. But I think creativity is best because it especially means effort against spiritual laziness, evolutionary laziness. And that means positive, toward the positive direction, toward enlightenment. This is zeal, people will use zealous, being zealous. But I like creativity because if you're being creative, to come to new understandings and new deeds of compassion, new understandings of wisdom. And so it's creative. And uh, the art of living, the art of helping others, the art of understanding, the scientific art of understanding reality. All of these arts are, are what are in this creativity. And that's the sixth one. And then the seventh one is realistic mindfulness, smriti, remembrance, and remembering yourself remembering that your mind is working, remembering to be aware of how your mind is working, remembering to be in the present and not stuck in memories of the past, not stuck in anticipations of the future, and being right in the moment of seeing what's happening in your being and in your mind to investigate reality. It's realistic remembrance or realistic mindfulness is actually, as they like to translate it now, I don't know if it's the best word, smriti or sati, in Pali, Smriti, and Sanskrit. And that word, that means you become aware of what's really happening now. You, you try to see it as it is and not just impose your labels on it. You notice that you see it through labeling it, but then you try to go deeper than your label and um, mental label. And, uh, then, and then finally, when you're really good about that and you notice the interrelativity of everything in your mind, and you explored corners of the mind, which you might thought there was some sort of absolute entity in there, forcing you to be a certain, certain way, you discover all kinds of that's all relationally constructed mentally. When you do that, then you want to really focus on the deepest nature of everything. So then you come to some uh, D. D means also thought. D means insight. It means understanding. D, genius, actually. D means. The with the H, you know, the, the aspirated da sound, dental, the, and a ah means double long a ah means at something in fo in some focus way, and some means total, so totally focused intelligence, some a ah, the, and then then that's when you really break through and combined with your awareness of how it's all working and its relativity and the failure to discover any absolute in it. The relativity of the seeming absolutes, the emptiness of emptiness, as it can be called, the freedom of freedom, 
of being some absolute thing apart from the things you're free from. So it's only relational, actually, <laughs> ultimately. And uh, you put your samadhi in that, and then you have the right view. Then you have all you, then you fulfill all of them at once. So it isn't like you do one and then leave it behind. They all come together uh, in that thing, but they go by that order. The reason they do, people wrongly think Buddhism is meditation only, or they think that about Hinduism too, but that's wrong because the Indian people knew very well that if you'd meditate a lot and you misunderstand what meditation is for, and you are still a protectjana, you think I, you have an absolute identity if you're so own separate from everything else. And if you think that and then you meditate a lot, you're going to leave, confirm your belief. So your view, your dusty, your, your, your outlook will be confirmed if you haven't critically analyzed it and to become more realistic and open-minded as your view. If your view is wrapped unconsciously around a sense of self-absoluteness, then your meditation will only make you feel more self-absolute. And it will be even, you'll, you'll become like a, a dictatorial guru and have a cult and it will blow up in your face. As they have all done, they all do. <laughs> Eventually, when people get tired of being bossed around, it's, people want to be free. That's the way they are. Okay. So thank you very much. I think I've gone a little too long. I'll find out in a minute whether it is and maybe have to redo some part. But I thank you very much. It's a great honor to deliver this in your wonderful samvada, your dialogue. And I look forward to meeting you all in person whenever that day can come. And um, Sarva Mangalam, or Tashi Delek, as, as they say in Tibet. And Sarva Mangalam, good fortune to all. <laughs>